So let's move on to some more detail on the connections. Uh, this shows a, another diagram of the single phase transformer. And again, I just want to emphasize one more time how we have these labeled. And so on the high side, you'll have the H1 and the H2 connectors. H1 and H2. Um, and then on the secondary side, you'll have X1, X2, and X3, where between X1 and X3, we've got the 240 volts. And so this is whatever we have for the phase connection on the high side. 240 is going to be between X1 and X3. And then we have a center tap, which is grounded. And so the center tap um, is going to basically establish a reference point where if you go from X1 to X2, you're going to get half the voltage. 240 divided by 2 is going to be 120 volts. And both these circuits um, would, would basically be similar. Uh, what we're going to see later on, what we like to do, if I'm going to put load on the X1, X2 versus the X2 to X3, that we try to equalize the loads because we want to make sure this current is as small as we can, as we can get it through the, through the X2 connection. The other thing we sometimes see in these diagrams, we sometimes see this dot notation. And so what this dot notation indicates that if I have a dot here, and if I have a dot here, and if I had a voltage here of say like 7,200 at zero degrees, and if I'm looking at this voltage over here, which is gonna be 240, that this is gonna be in phase with the secondary. If the dot were at the bottom, that means we can have a 180 degree phase connection. For single phase transformers, this isn't really going to make any difference. However, when we have three phase transformers, we're putting together a three phase bank built on single phase transformers. It's very, very important to keep an eye on, on the dot notation, how you actually connect this up. So in a residential application, if you're going to flip X3 and X1, that, that might work OK. But that's not going to work if you have like a three phase transformer bank built out of single phase transformers. This shows a little bit more detail on these connections. And what this is showing is it's showing a couple different ways we could actually use this single phase transformer. Uh, on the top here, uh, we're showing connections that could either be line to neutral or line to line. In the United States, we do have cases where we do connect the transformers up line to line. There's no, there's no grounded um, wire on the primary side and some circuits are ungrounded. So in this case, you'd have two high voltage bushings in this case if it's a line to line connection. If you don't have need for 240 volts, what you can do is you can parallel the connections on the secondary of the dual voltage transformer. So basically what this does is it basically doubles the current handling capability. You only have 120 volts, but you can, you can handle more load current if you put those sets of windings together in, in parallel. So anyway, this is showing an example where we have a line to line connection on the left. And then we have a, a kind of more of our standard four wire line to neutral connection on the right. Most of the times what you're going to see is what's shown here at the bottom. So again, you're going to have three sets of wires um, connecting it up to points X2, X1, and X3 as shown here. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be grounding this, this X2 connection. So I just want to make a few observations on this this leakage reactants because leakage reactants is probably the biggest uh, impedance effect that we're going to see when we're doing modeling. This is going to usually result in the bulk of the voltage drop. And so, as I mentioned before, leakage is what we have when we have a winding. And some of this, lot, most of this flux goes to the core. But some of this flux is going to leak out into free space. And so one thing we're going to see as far as a leakage is concerned, the leakage flux is concerned, 
is we don't have any saturation associated with that effect. So if I'm going to be modeling the equivalent inductance associated with that, it's going to be a constant. It doesn't make any difference how much current's actually flowing. Um, that equivalent leakage inductance is, is going to be constant. Um, you don't see that with the core, depending on how you operate the core, the core could actually saturate, but the leakage reactance or the leakage um, inductance never saturates, it basically stays constant. We can actually manipulate this leakage reactance depending on how we design the transformer. And so this leakage reactance we're going to have depends on how many turns we have, how many different winding wraps we have, and it also depends on the geometry of the core and also the winding. So to some degree, we can make the leakage smaller, we can make the, the leakage larger. And how do we manage this besides um, the number of windings and the core geometry? Well, what we can do is we can manage the leakage depending on the spacings between the windings. So if we keep the spacings between the windings small, we keep everything wound kind of tight, we, we, mini we kind of minimize the leakage effect. So we're going to keep these spacings and everything pretty close together. And by managing the dimensions of the windings, we, we could actually control leakage to some degree. So again, remember what leakage is in our transformer model. It's this series reactance. This is going to be associated with, with the voltage drop. So one thing we're going to see because of leakage is we're going to see a a drop in voltage going from the primary side and per unit to the secondary side and per unit. We're going to get a voltage drop across here. And so that's something that may be an issue because the voltage drops too low, then the customer loads are going to have some power quality issues. The other thing is that if I've got current flowing through here, that I squared times this equivalent leakage reactance is going to correspond to the reactive power that's going to be consumed by that leakage. And so I have to have some reactants, some reactive power, some VARs coming from someplace to supply that I squared X. So that's something else we need to factor in. And the larger the load gets, the more reactive power I need to supply um, that, that leakage flow. Uh, one thing that the leakage does as well is if I have a short circuit on the transformer, if I have a fault current, is it leakage limits fault current. And so in that sense, maybe we may want to have a certain minimum amount of leakage because if we don't have that leakage reactance then the, the fault current can get rather large. And so that might actually be a reason we may want to add some leakage to the circuit is so we can, we can manage the fault current. Uh, another thing I want to just say a few things about before I get into the examples is if, if I'm a distribution planner, then what determines exactly what type of transformer I buy? And you got to keep in mind the scope of this because if, if I'm a distribution planner and if I'm just looking at one circuit, let's say, I've got miles of primary backbone, you know, maybe like five miles. I might have tens of miles of laterals. I mean, there's actually some circuits maybe get up to 100 miles of laterals. So some of these distribution circuits get kind of large. And these circuits are going to have hundreds of transformers, maybe between hundreds and thousands of customers hooked up to them. So these circuits are pretty massive. And a, a big investment item for these circuits is the cost of these transformers. Uh, so again, you're going to have hundreds of transformers just on one feeder. And if I've got 1,000, 2,000 feeders out there, then I'm going to have maybe like 100,000 some transformers out there in my fleet, right? And that's just for customer distribution transformers. And so what you, what you need to do is you need to very carefully specify, you know, what type of transformer you want made by your vendor. And there's really no off the shelf distribution transformer that all the utilities buy because the utilities can act, actually, we're gonna customize these transformers because you have a choice on what to use for the size of the windings, uh, the number of windings, you can actually um, have some choice over what are gonna be the no load losses or the, um, 
the um, losses you're going to have as a function of the load current. I mean, there's a lot of different ways a vendor could actually build a transformer. And depending on how much you want to pay for it, you know, they could build you a better transformer or maybe a, not as a quality transformer, right? So anyway, this is where you get into transformer specification. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because this is getting a little bit of, above the scope of this course. But if, if you're looking into what to spend on the transformer, what you need to know is you need to know what's going to be going on as far as load growth is concerned for your, for your loads. I mean, if, if you have, you're expecting a lot of extra load in these transformers in the future, you might want to have these set up where the losses are lower, let's say. So you need to factor in what's the shape of the load curve, whether you have like harmonics or not, what's the ambient temperature conditions, the hotter it gets, the more stress it puts on the transformer. So you might have to build these more robustly or with larger ratings if the temperatures are going to be getting very high. You need to consider your, your capital cost as far as if I have a system that I'm going to be hooking a transformer to, if that transformer is going to have more losses associated with it, maybe I should have used kilowatts here. But it's going to cost more to actually um, hook up that given transformer if it's got higher losses, right? Because it's gonna put more stress in the network, not just for one transformer, but just keep in mind if we got 100,000 transformers out there and if there's a difference in say like 10 watts on losses, that's gonna add up from a system-wide standpoint, right? You need to know something about um, what's gonna be your expected depreciation rates. You know, how long do you need to have your equipment last or you know what kind of, assumptions you make in your financial calculations. Um, if a given utility is going to have a, a, a cost of money, and so if it's going to have to borrow money, then it's got to figure out how to make the best use of that of their loans. Um, and then also, what's especially what's your cost of no load and load losses? And so all this stuff has to factor into the specification of the transformer that you buy from a vendor. Um, then you figure out what's your, your maintenance cost. You know, if you have high personnel costs, you might want to have more robust transformers in the field. And then there's the, the cost of just your organization handling these transformers in, in inventory. So maybe you don't have every conceivable size that you can get. You know, maybe you limit your sizes even further than what's available in the standards. So there's a IEEE guide for doing what we call a loss evaluation, uh, C57.120.2017. And again, you say, I'm not expecting you guys to be able to, to work this on exams, um, but I just want to let you guys know that this sort of documentation exists. And, and basically what you start looking at when you're considering getting a, a transformer design for you is what's your, what's your going to be your cost of ownership. And so you got actually the cost of acquiring the equipment. That's one thing. But you got to keep in mind that once that transformer is in, in the field and connected up your system, then there's going to be costs associated with losses. All right. So it doesn't always pay to get the cheapest transformer. You know, it doesn't pay to keep P as low as you can get it. You got to consider these other components as well when you're sizing, when you're, when you're purchasing transformers. And so what these terms refer to is these returns refer to what's your no load losses. So there's gonna be core losses. So if you got cheap transformers that consume a lot of um, power because of no load losses, and that's gonna hurt you in the long run, right? And then the other things you would consider is gonna be, um, you know, what's your losses when you put load on there so that's going to be due, due to the series resistance and then there's going to be losses for your fans now this isn't for distribution transformers as much as for like your substation transformers so this is what you need to take into account and a lot of times if you're purchasing um, transformers from a vendor they'll actually just ask you you know well, what's your cost of losses and then based on that, you know, they could actually help you figure out like what type of transformer uh, you need. 
so anyway, when you look at these no load losses here, if as far as getting, you know, what is this A factor here? Uh, these are all sorts of different things that would feed into this. Um, your cost of system capacity, dollars per kilowatt. Uh, how much does it cost to put up, put in upstream cables or, or have generation, et cetera? What's your cost of energy? What's your cost of fuel, for example? Um, fixed charge rate, this is your kind of related to your cost of taking out loans. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but you can calculate what the A factor is based on your cost of losses. And then um, you can also consider your load losses um, in a, this as well, where basically as a function of your load curve, then what you're gonna get is you're gonna get um, losses as well that are gonna be a function of loading. And so when you have all this information in here, you, get, you can get the B factor. And then from having this A factor and this B factor, you can actually take your losses into account when you're actually doing these, these types of purchases. And transformers are always connected into the system. So keep in mind your no load, load, no, no load losses are there all the time, right? Um, in the next lecture, we'll, we'll get into some of the DOE standards on efficiency, but it turns out in the United States that the Department of Energy actually has a relatively new standard, which talks about, you know, what type of loss characteristics you need for any transformers that would be um, manufactured and purchased in the future. Okay, so we'll next be getting into doing some transformer calculations and, and since I got this slide up let me just go ahead and finish with this and we'll move into the next video segment uh, you know as far as the calculations are concerned obviously we're going to be doing some voltage drop calculations the voltage drop across that series resistance and reactance some other things we're going to do as well is we're going to calculate a term called percent voltage regulation and this is the amount of voltage change I'm going to get as I go between rated and no load or, or vice versa, right? So this is how much the voltage is going to swing. Um, rated current, keep in mind, this is your rated KVA divided by your rated KV. Um, and then this percent regulation is going to be defined as this difference between no load voltage and full load voltage divided by full load times 100%. No load is when you have the higher voltage when you load it up the voltage drops. And so that's kind of why you do it this particular way. Uh, percent efficiency is another calculation we do. That's power output divided by power in, where the power input is going to be your power output plus whatever winding losses you have. This is going to be um, an I squared R type of loss where the R is this series resistance. And then the core loss is normally assumed to be constant. And that's sometimes referred to as a no load loss. And then we're going to do a lot of these calculations in per unit, where what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to calculate a rated um, power and convert that and use that for our power base. We'll have voltage bases, which correspond to rated voltage as well. And then based on this, we can get the base current and the, and the base impedance. Uh, so anyway, let me go ahead and stop here. In the next segment, we'll, we'll work through some different examples then.